Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, let's make dua inshallah before we start. Allahumma amin. Allahumma tassalamu minka salam tabarakta ya dal jalali wal ikram. Allahumma rabbana yassar wa la tu'assar wa tamam bil khair. Wa bika nasta'een ya fattah. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka anta al-alimul hakim. Allahumma rabbana zinna ilma nafi'ah wa amala mutakabbala. Wa rizqan wasi wa shifa'a min kulli dah. فسبحان ربك رب العزة أما يسفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين قال رب شرح لي ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لسان يفقه قولي Last class we stopped on page 417 That's where I stopped on which I have in notes here And we were talking Right <laughs> 417, you'll have 416, I'll have 417, and we stop on page 417, I had a piece of it. Um, we were talking on the destruction of Masjid al-Aqsa. It will be on page 416, you'll see there, mentioning on the destruction of Masjid al-Aqsa. And what took place that brought about the destruction of Masjid al-Aqsa. And... The surroundings and Banu Israel at that time. What took place from page 4, 15, 16, 17? We spoke about their disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the number of things that contributed towards that disobedience, that their whole life and cycle we mentioned in the last class were total disobedience to Allah. And we said that those qualities are not far fetched from the what? The, customs and the way that the Muslims themselves behave today with respect to the Quran, the Sunnah, and the lifestyle of this deen has totally what, went away from it. And we had mentioned that the Hadith of the Prophet that talks about the, our nation being divided into what? 73 different sects and one only being on the path towards and the road towards Jannah. And we saw what Allah SWT promised them in the ayat in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, that tells us that Allah SWT says because of their way and their habits and their disobedience to Allah, Allah will destroy them twice. And the first of such occasions we were speaking about when Nebuchadnezzar came with a formidable army and what? Wiped out all of those people. He killed one third. He captured one third of them and he trampled upon the other remaining people. And then he ran them through the lands wherever he could have found them, take them up. Then he mashed up the entire city, even destroying Masjid al-Aqsa, leaving nothing to what? Stand. This was the condition that they were left in. And Masjid al-Aqsa was also destroyed in the process. Allah SWT had promised them this in the Quran, which we have read last class, where in Surah Al-Baqarah, they had given that indication that Allah is going to destroy them twice. The first of such occasion is this. Now, during this time, they were also being faced with a number of challenges and, 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 and fights and wars which were never stopping. But the actual destruction, one such occasion, is this which is mentioned by Nebuchadnezzar. When he came and what? Destroyed all of it. So... On page 417, it mentioned there that if you just have to follow and listen, that when he came, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, ransacked Baitul Maqaddas. He conquered the city, looted the property, and took back a lot of people as prisoners of war. When he left, he had a member of his family of the former king appointed as a ruler over the city as his deputy when this new king worshiped idols and was corrupt he rebelled against nebuchadnezzar remember we mentioned that last class he himself feel what since i become king now i am better than nebuchadnezzar i am stronger than him but he was the what the most tyrant ruler ever existing at that time in babylon and when this news of the king returned he came with a, a formidable army, Nebuchadnezzar. He killed one third of them and he enslaved another third. And then he left those who were old, disabled and ill and trampled them up under the feet of their horses. 
finish them off. He killed all able-bodied persons, burned the Torah, and raised Masjid al-Aqsa from its foundation. Nebuchadnezzar then attacked all the lands of Syria, chased the Israelites, killed them wherever he found them. After he had destroyed them, he came back to Baitul Muqaddis. He, Nebuchadnezzar, saw Jeremiah salam, in prison. This was the prophet at the time. And he told him about his mission and the rejection of his people. So he was freed from prison by Nebuchadnezzar. Imagine, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed all of them. While they imprisoned their prophet, Nebuchadnezzar came and what? Freed the prophet. Allah promised their destruction and also safeguarded his prophet in the hands of the enemy. He was invited by Nebuchadnezzar to return with him to Babylon, but Jeremiah refused and took refuge in the wilderness. He did not want to go with him. He went into the wilderness and left the place abandoned. Nebuchadnezzar then took the booties and the captives that was made of thousands of Israelites from various tribes and made his journey back to Babylon. Allah then told Jeremiah to return to the ruins of the city and live as Allah restore it with inhabitants. When Jeremiah went to Jerusalem by the command of Allah, the entire picture of destruction circulated in his mind. And he must have asked himself what means or by what means would once again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create or bring back this city to life. Now, this was the destruction of one such occasion. And Jeremiah himself saw this destruction and he wanted to even know how this could have happened. The reconstruction of the Masjid al was something that Allah himself also promised that would happen again. If they reform themselves, he will give them back Masjid al-Aqsa and reconstruct it again and rebuild it. So the incident of this took place, it's reconstruction, and this is this, the reconstruction during the time of Jeremiah and the prophet called Uzair. All right? So between the both Jeremiah and Uzair, then after him came the period of what? Zachariah and Yahya, John the Baptist, which will be the second occasion we will talk about the destruction of Masjid al-Aqsa. But in this reconstruction state, we are talking about where Uzair was present and seeing this destruction as well. All right? So reconstruction of Baitul Muqaddis. The Holy Quran states, or like the one who passed by a town and it had fallen down upon its roof. He said, how can Allah ever revive this that it is fallen up, down upon its roof? He said, so what Allah did? How can Allah ever revive this after it's what? It's totally what ruined. So Allah decreed for him to die for a hundred years. Then raised him to life and asked him, How long have you laid here? He replied, I might have laid here for a day or part of a day. He said, But you have laid here for a hundred years. Uzair. So he said, Look to your food and drink. It had not spoiled. And look at your donkey that was made that we make a sign for you and the people and look at the bones, how we bring them together and clothe them with flesh. So when it became clear to him, he said, I know that Allah has power over all things. Surah Baqarah, Surah 2, verse 259. This ayat, many commentators of the Quran, Fasirin, such as Ibn Abbas, Ali, and Abdullah bin Salam has stated that this person in the verse is Uzair. This ayat of Quran, verse 259 in Surah Al-Baqarah, is referring to Uzair. According to Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Salam, they refer it to him. Others like Qatada and Ikrama narrates that this could have been Jeremiah or Aramiya. 
who was also in close proximity when this incident took place. Now, to understand the connection here is that some of the people who were kept in captive and went back to Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar, they said that it could have been among them Daniel and Uzair. Whereas some of the commentators mentioned that this is Uzair, and the only place that Uzair was mentioned in the Quran and by name is also when they, were, they took Uzair as the son of Allah, the son of God. All right? And this is how the connection and the link actually gives reference and evidence that it is really Uzair. Because both of them live and share around the same time of this incident took place. So, the Holy Quran illustrates the incident of a person who passed by a town that was in utter ruins. The building has all collapsed and their roofs caved in. On seeing this sight, he wondered in astonishment, how could Allah restore this place to life? Now, Uzair, being the prophet of Allah, looking at this structure, is not thinking and saying this that Allah is incapable of doing it, you know. He's not saying this in the, in the imputation that his iman is weak, but he knows that Allah can do this. But to himself, he is saying, you know, it's as though like Ibrahim alayhi salam. When Ibrahim alayhi salam wanted to know about what? Life and death. He says, how can Allah give life after death? And he says, Awalam Tukmin, do you not believe? Allah asked him, he says, do you not believe? He says, Bala, of course I believe. But not that he does not believe. Qalbi. But he wants to satisfy his heart. His heart in actually seeing the condition of life, how it comes to the individual, this is what is happening. So Uzair in a similar condition, he knows that Allah can bring this back to life anytime he so wills. But he wants to see how this happens. He wants to see how this happens. And that is really to satisfy this heart. The building, so he wondered in astonishment how could Allah restore this place to life? This was not due to any doubts in regard to Allah's ability to enact this qadr of faith. But it was merely an exclamation of surprise that instinctively escape a person's tongue. You know, in amazement, I wonder if this could ever get back life. <laughs> or if this is, what could ever happen here again? This, this place, you know, we see utter destruction to something. We could say this could never happen again. This could never change. But Allah, in his man, in a normal lay way that a human will speak, this is how it came out. Consequently, Allah caused him to die and remain in the state of death for 100 years. Where after he was brought back to life, Allah asked him, for how long had he remained in the state of death? Allah asked him, for how long he had remained in the state of death? And, where after he was brought back to life? So hereupon, whereupon it mentioned that his death came to him during the mid-morning. So it could have been around what? Just before what? Zohar time? In the mid-morning time? And it was just before the sunset, a hundred years later, that life came back to him. So he died around the morning time, mid-morning time, and before sunset, he got back life. For this reason, when the question was posed to him, he glanced at the sun and guessed a day had passed. He just guessed what a day just passed. Upon observing that the sun had not yet set, he added that perhaps it was only a part of the day wherein he had remained dead. So he didn't think that it was what? A hundred years? He just think it was just part of a day. And what is interesting is that to die for a hundred years and the condition that Allah kept him in. 
Allah corrected his misjudgment, informing him that a hundred years had passed. Don't just think it's a few hours, but one hundred years of your life has gone. A hundred years has elapsed since you died. Despite this long period, Allah has preserved his body as if it had been, la as though it was what? Lying there for only a few hours. Allah kept him as though he was in sleep for 100 years and not even what? Being affected. We know if a person dies and you let's leave them there in open environment in a matter of what? Not days, hours. He already what? Starts decomposing and start giving off an odor. But he, Allah, kept him in this condition for hundreds of years. He thinking it's a few hours and his body remained in a condition as though nothing happened. Nothing happened as though it was just like sleep. It's as you get up from sleep, you know, sometimes we think like that sometimes too, you know. Sometimes we get up or 10 minutes sleep and we sleep, think we sleep like 10 hours. Because sometimes we go into what? Intense sleep. But in this case, his intense sleep is of the form and the nature of death. But it wasn't just for what? A few hours. It was for a hundred years. Then Allah displayed his immense power by drawing his attention to the food which he also remained perfectly fresh like his body. The thing that will be that perishable and will be destroyed in the shortest period of time, you know, disintegrated in the shortest time was what? His fruits, his grapes, his juice, and his bread that he normally had with him, this food, what he had, this remained intact. Thereafter, Allah demonstrated to him how he reconstructed the decomposed body of his donkey, turning his attention to his donkey, which was what? Totally rotted. Not just rotted and seen flesh or you seen skin and bone. You ain't seen those things. You seen the bones turn to dust. If you touch, you know, your animal stayed off for so long, if you touch the bones, it's actually what? Disintegrated into dust. This is the decomposition state of the donkey. It was already finished. Nothing like a donkey shape in terms of you seeing the rib cage or you seeing any of these things. All of it was what? Finished. All its bones were scattered about. In other words, you're seeing pieces that fall apart and they just what? Like dust lay out in a layer. <laughs> in a nature like how it would just fall and just rot it out. But Allah collected them together to arrange them properly, fixing back each part of the bones. Then Allah covered the bones in flesh to complete the reconstruction after which it was brought back to life. So just as he clothed it, he brought it back to life in front of the eyes of Uzair and in the eyes of the Quran and in the commenta commentary that is mentioned that this is a sign for us. When it was all completed before his eyes, he burst out, I know that Allah is able to do all things. Since he was a, a mu'min or believer, this fact was always known to him. He knew this. He knew that Allah could do this. But the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him away for a hundred years and brought him back is not that Uzair wants to know about this now, but this in the Quran is not just for Uzair or for Banu Israel, but it's for us believers. It is us, there for us as believers to teach us a lesson. And what is that lesson? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us clearly that He can replace us at any given point in time. Don't feel that we are too righteous or we are too good. That we are the only thing serving Allah and Allah cannot replace us. Or we think to ourselves that we are in the position of righteousness and continue to live a life that doesn't really reflect the true righteousness and obedience to Allah. Because Allah can replace that condition anytime. That's why a person must always make dua to keep 
that Allah keeps him on the path of guidance. Mustaqim. Always ask Allah to keep us on this straight path because this path is not just something that we get. In other words, that we feel that we have it. But it's a favor that Allah has bestowed upon us. It is a bounty upon us. And so Uzair himself, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing that it is not just only Uzair wanted to satisfy his heart or by his mere statement, but he is showing to all of mankind in this ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just only can take out one person, but he can wipe out an entire nation of people. He can destroy an entire town. He can destroy all of it and then bring it back to his condition that he so wills. And what took place? The restoration of the Torah as well, because when Nebuchadnezzar went, he also what? Finished away with the Torah, burnt out everything, not a single piece of scripture also, left in the land. So for a hundred years, after Nebuchadnezzar did his destruction, they were also out of the Torah. It came out of their hands. When Nebuchadnezzar defected, defeated the Israelites, he also destroyed all the copies of the Torah. The Israelites had no copy of the Torah left, nor was there any individual among them who had memorized it entirely. So there was no one in that condition who had known the Torah entirely, but they have known what? Some know a part, some know an X piece, certain sections, but not all of them knew the entire thing. But when When they were released from Babylon, they were concerned about obtaining the Torah. When they were released from Babylon. It was around this time that Uzair, and I was talking about a hundred years after, it was around this time that Uzair had also mounted his donkey after the hundred years. His donkey had been got, given back life to him, and he mounted his donkey and traveled until he came to the neighborhood, but no one could recognize him, neither he could recognize any one of them. So he just, he, Allah told him you had slept for a hundred years, he mounted the donkey as like nothing had happened, he got up from rest, squeezed out the grapes, make a little juice, soft me bread, had a little, what do you call it, that dinner or whatever, early dinner, mounted his donkey, went down to his hometown, as though everything is going to be in order as he went. But when he went there, no one knew him and he knew no one. Then he went to his house, confused in his thoughts, still thinking whether or not the place looks so different. He found an old lady who was blind and disabled, con disabled and was more than 120 years old. In front of his house, a lady who was more than 120 years old. That lady was the servant to them at that time, who was just only, what, 20 years old then. <laughs> when Uzair salam, left the house, she was only 20 years old. Uzair salam, said to her, Oh, you old lady, is that the house of Uzair? Is this the house of Uzair? She replied, Yes, this is the house of Uzair. And started crying. She started what? Cry. She then said, I have not seen anyone for so many years who have remembered Uzair. So many years have gone and no one knew about Uzair. People have forgotten him. Well, a hundred years gone is a long time. We just forget people after a few months. <laughs> far less for a hundred years. So Uzair alayhi salam said, I am Uzair. Allah has caused me death for 100 years and now he has brought me back to life. So he says to the servant, I have been dead for 100 years. She exclaims saying, we have lost Uzair for about 100 
years and we did not hear anything about him. He, Uzziah, said that indeed, I am that Uzair that you are talking about you lost for 100 years. I am that Uzair. She said, well, if you are that Uzair, he was a man whom Allah has accepted his prayer. He was such a devoted servant of Allah that Allah accepts all of his dua and his supplication. And he healed the sick and those who were inflicted with any illness. This was Uzair. Anybody who's sick, he used to what? Make the water Allah, Allah would cure them. By his prayer. And he healed the sick and those who were inflicted with any illness by his prayer. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so he said, so pray to Allah so that he may return me my sight and may I may see you. So she's saying, I am blind. If it is, you are Uzair. Pray to Allah. Let Allah give me back my sight. So I can see if this is really the Uzair. Were you to be Uzair, salam, I would recognize you. So Uzair, salam, prayed to Allah and then passed his hands over her eyes. Her eyes became healthy. And he held her hand and said, stand up. By the will of Allah and Allah's promise, stand up. She stood up and walked and became healthy and looked at him and said, I bear witness that you are Uzair. Because the way he left and the way he returned, same way. There were no changes. He did not grow old. He did not have any gray beards. He did not look any way different in his physical face or anything like that. However, she wasn't the same person as she was 20 years old. She became 120 years old. But Uzair, after returning from 100 years, returned only at the age that he left. Which was, <laughs> he was at the age of 40. Uzair was at the age of 40, and he looked at that age as 40. She went to the neighborhood of the Israelites, who already established themselves, or re-established them, because the Israelites, after they were freed by Nebuchadnezzar, and were taken over by the king at that time from what? Iran, I mentioned, who came and conquered all of the lands of Babylon, and freed the Israelites and allowed them to go back and reconstruct and help in the reconstruction of Masjid al -Aqsa, all of these things. So Uzair now, after that long period of time, come back to his life by the will of Allah, given, who had given him life, comes to see his town, come to his home and recognize his maid, but seeing it, totally what? Brought back to life. She went to the neighborhood with him now, of the Israelites, who were gathered in their clubs and assemblies and to the son of Uzair, who was 118 years old. So his son was 118 years old. And to his grandchildren, and call on them, saying, So she went with him, and she was saying, Uzair has come back to you. But they could not believe her. They could not believe what she was saying. She said to them, I am so and so your Maid servant. She says, I am the one who used to take care of you all so many years ago. I am that same woman. And Uzair salam, has prayed for me and I was healed and I am no more blind and disabled. Look at me. I can see all of you. Uzair salam, claimed that Allah had caused him death for 100 years and then revived his life. People now rushed towards him and they came to him. His son said, my father had a black mole between his shoulder blades. He had a black mole between his shoulder blades. So Uzair salam, uncovered his shoulder. He uncovered his shoulder and there was the black mole. The Israelites said, there is one like Uzair. There is no one or there is none like Uzair salam, among us who could have memorized the Torah. In other words, no one knew the Torah like Uzair. So now the challenge is not just the mole on the back to know who he is, or bringing the maid and giving her life and the ability to walk and to see. 
Now they also want. And they knew that Uzziah was the only one who could what? Restore to them the Torah. Nebuchadnezzar had burned the Torah and nothing is left of it except what people had memorized of it, whatever little portion. So they asked him to write it for them. Uzair's father hid one of the copy of the Torah in a place nobody knew except Uzair. One copy of this Torah was hidden only by who was who were aware of it was Uzair. He went with them to that place and dug the Torah out. Its pages were rotten, and the writings faded out. So Uzair, alayhi salam, in that condition, then sat down under a tree with the Israelites surrounding him. Because the Torah was what? Totally decomposed. He couldn't what? Recognize anything. The pages, everything rotten out. And in this condition, it is said that two flames came down from the sky and entered into his chest. And so he remembered the Torah and rewrote it from, for them. That is why the Israelites claim that Uzair salam, was the son of Allah. The Holy Quran states, and the Jews said, Uzair is the son of Allah. Surah Tawbah, Surah number 9, verse 30. Mentions that it says that he, Uzair, is the son of Allah. Ibn Abbas anhu, asked Abdullah bin Salam about the verse, and he replied, It is the story of Uzair. In regarding Uzair ibn Allah and that ayah that came before, that mentions about the town and the city in Surah Al Baqarah of Banu Israel. Abdullah bin Salam says that indeed it was Uzair. And how he rewrote the Torah for them from this memory, from his memory, Israelites said, Moses alayhi salam could not bring us the Torah but by a book. But Uzair alayhi salam brought it without any book. And hence, he is indeed the son of Allah. That is why they made this claim. There and then, he, he, of course, he did this claim. It. <laughs> you know, because he, he proved to them, you know, that this Torah, he himself went to what? Dig it out, to take it out, and show that what? You know, this is, but he himself said, down at this tree, look, well, at least I thought I had a copy of the, the Torah with me. But it was what? Totally rotted out. So apart from the donkey being what? Rotted out, the Torah also rotted out. But Allah what? Implemented in his heart and imprinted in his heart the, the, the Torah once again into his memory, and what he made it into that book for them again. So, Uzair, you know, he said, Ibn Abbas said that we make you a sign for people. Surah Baqarah 2, 259, that ayah that mentions that in Surah Baqarah, verse 259, it means that the Israelites became his, his sons were older than him in appearance. Uzair, meaning a sign to the people, Imagine where you'd find a father looking 40 and his son looking 112 years old. Right? So he could actually what? Take care of his sons instead. <laughs> so his sons look 112 and he look 40 years, I won't say old, you gotta be young this time. So he was much more what? In a better state than his children. This, Allah says, is a sign for all of us. That he has control over everything. Because when he died, he was only 40 years old. And when he was re resurrected, after 100 years, he was resurrected with the appearance of the same age he died with. At the same age of 40. Without seeing any trace of what? Old age. So this was the end and the reconstruction. The first stage for the destruction of Banu Israel and the reconstruction of it. While Uzair were not in existence for that hundred years, they repatriated and came back to the land. They rebuilt the entire thing with the help of the king of Iran at that time. And they became a normal nation, better again. And Uzair came to see that Allah can restore all of this. But in all of that, the hikmah and the wisdom is also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restored to them by his prophet Uzair again the Torah. So it came back to them through Uzair. All right? 
So we'll stop at this point today, inshallah. And the next class, inshallah, we'll continue. We'll continue and we'll start with the second phase with the coming of Isa, Zachariah, and the second destruction of Masjid Al-Aqsa, which would have been the end until the time of Umar. After the second destruction of Masjid Al-Aqsa, <laughs> after the second destruction, the next time it was reconstructed was at the time of Umar. Which we'll also discuss at that time, inshallah. So let us go to our tafsir now, inshallah. Surah Al-Waqiyah. And Surah Al-Waqiyah, we had stopped on verse 51. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillahi rahman rahim Surah Al-Waqiyah refers to the occurrence of the time or the hour when the day of judgment would come upon us and the signs and the things that Allah would cause to happen and he mentions about the three types of groups of people who would assemble around the throne of Allah. The group of people who will be in the front, who are the Sabiqun, the people to the right, Ashabul Yameen, and the people to the left, who are the Ashabu Shimal. The three groups of people. The Sabiqun, who are the most preferred group of people, then the people on the right hand, the general mass of believers, and the people on the left hand, whom are the ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause to go towards the fire of hell. And we mentioned here from verse 41 onwards until 51 where it talks about the Ashabu, Ashabu Shimal whom Allah has disgraced and put to the fire of hell because of their what? They'll be in that position. Allah says, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَبْلَهُمْ ذَلِكَ مُتْرَفِينَ They used to live a life of what? Luxury in this world. It's not just the luxury of enjoyment, of comfort. Not that we're talking about a life of luxury denying the presence of Allah in their life. In other words, you live a life as though you are God. That you are better than anyone else. And everyone must serve you because you have what? Wealth make you great. Your position makes you great. Allah is saying, because of this, this disgrace has come upon you. You deny Allah and you make yourself your own ilah, your own God. And then he mentions about them. وَكَانُوا يُسْرُونَ عَلَى الْهِنْكْثَ الْعَظِيمِ وَكَانُوا يَقُولُونَ إِذَا مِتْنَا وَكُنَّا تُرُوبًا وَعِذَوْمًا عَبْعُوثُونَ That you all used to also say, well, when we die and turn into bones and we are all rotted out, then we will never come back to life. Who is going to ever do this? And we just did the story of Uzair. Who will ever do it again? Allah will bring us back to life. And he says, لَا أَكِلُونَ مِنْ شَجَرٍ مَغْزَكُمْ From verse 51, he mentions here now, that the people whom, because of their denial and their lying from verse 51, it says, for them, Allah says in verse 52, La akhiluna min shajarim min zakum. They shall eat from the tree in the fire of hell, which is a zakum. This tree is a shrub or bush in a tree that has a very bitter taste. If we think of something that is very bitter in taste, and we wouldn't use another cough medicines as being very bitter. But this bush that they would eat as zakum is so bitter that they will, out of their starvation for food, they will eat this. They will eat this as though they never what? As though they are not seeing food and they are not getting food. But in consuming this, it causes pain. It causes intense destruction of the stomach. It's as though you eat pepper sauce with only vinegar in it. Three quarters of the pepper sauce is what? Pure vinegar. And this is nothing in comparison to this, this bitter bush. This is nothing in comparison to this bitter bush. And I don't just talk about this woolly life. That causes the in, entire stomach to what? Go in a state of disarray and rupture and rip open. From? Shajaris zakum. Fa mali una min halbutun. It doesn't benefit the stomach. And then they will drink upon that boiling water. After consuming this zakum to quench this bitterness, they drink boiling water. This is how their day would be when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings resurrection. This is how their life would be when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed them in the fire of hell. That the end of this life that they used to live, mutarafin, thinking to themselves that we are the best and there's nothing to come better than us and no one will be better than me ever. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wait to this time reach, and you see your food, and you will see your drink, and you will live in an abode that you will regret for the entire time that you will be there, and there will be no end to that time. There will be no end to that time. No end to a time like that. And imagine, a person today, if they go through a little stress for a week or two, your mind is what? Totally lost. Your, your body starts to lose weight. You start to feel distressed. You start to feel like your, your world crashing in on you. But this nature and torment is going to continue and there is no end to it. There is no end to it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't just place this here to just tell us about the punishment of those who deny Allah, you know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed that ayat and these ayats here in categorizing the condition of the people that we have mentioned of the three groups. And the third group, which is this group, Allah ta'ala also describes their position. It is not just to tell them or warn them or to tell us about them, but to tell us what is going to come after this life. And this is what we have to be mindful of. If we think to ourselves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not a plan for us, Allah has already Tell, told us here in this Quran that this is going to happen. These three groups of people, this is how they're going to be meted out in the life to come. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns his attention in this surah for us to look at, saying, Nahnu khalaqanakum falawla tusaddiqoon. That we, Allah Rabbul Izzah is saying, I am the one who created you. Why don't you accept that? Why don't you accept the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you? After describing the qualities and the condition of this, then why don't you accept me, Allah? I have created you. He says, Do you know what you were? Do you not see or ponder and think what you were? You were just a mere what? Fluid. You were just fluid. You were nothing more than that. So he says, Afaro ma tumnoon, you are just this. Antum taklakuna huam nahnul khalikun. Who created it? Who created life? Man thinks to himself, well, I just get married, or I have a relationship with my spouse, and I have children. So he thinks when he gets married, what's going to happen? He's going to have children. He's going to he thinks in his mind, he's planning, he's arranging everything: house, land, car. Wife, children, business set up, everything going good. That is his plan. But Allah says, think to yourself, Antum am Who created this? You or I? Who is the real creator here? Allah asks this question in a condition, telling us clearly that we ought to recognize something. You are just a fluid. You were in nothing in a state in the very instant when man was created. They were created in the system and in the order of Allah making and fashioning from clay. And then Allah SWT changed the formation of the creation of man that they will cohabitate with their spouses and they will have what? Children. And the process being that they will go through a fluid-like system, something that is discharged and does not even seem to worth anything. It does not seem to worth anything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us some something, a fluid that does not seem of value. Am nahnu khaliqun. You created it or I created it? How can a fluid ever make life? We study biology today, yes? Doctors understand the process today. But Allah is saying, this fluid cannot come to life on its own. And then we talk about eggs and X and Y and all these different things. But Allah is saying, before all of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you are in this. So who has made this man, who has given him this ability to come in this condition after co cohabitation, that this child will be placed into this womb? He says, نَحْنُ قَدَّرْنَا بَيْنَكُمُ الْمَوْتَ وَمَا نَحْنُ مَسْبُكِينَ Firstly, I've given you life. When you are placed in that, that womb, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes it to get life. You cannot do that. No doctor, the best physician, the best doctor you could find, gynecologist, and we have so many different types of procedures today, from in vitro to IVF and whatever you have, all different types of procedures that people try to do today, to what? Get pregnant, to have a child. No matter what they try, the best specialist in even thinking about producing a child can only do what? The chemical reaction. But the end result of bringing life and formation of life can only happen by the will of Allah. No matter how you try, no matter what you try, life can only come when Allah says, be and it is. No matter what you try. So he's saying, you think about it carefully. Oh man, I created you. Why don't you be truthful and recognize that? But today, man think themselves, and many people play games with this, this system of birth and try to what? Use different types of chemicals to either have a boy child or a girl child and use different things. And they play games with what? What Allah has made in his system. But note, Allah is saying, despite all of this, who gives life? It is Allah. None but Allah. And he says, نَحْنُ قَدَّرْنَا بَيْنَكُمُ الْمَوْتُ وَمَا نَحْنُ مَسْبُقِينَ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who disdains that. He is the one who orders that. And when he orders that, وَمَا نَحْنُ مَسْبُقِينَ You know that, who could there be anyone who can what? Determine that? Can any of us tell ourselves when we are going to die? No one knows and they can never make preparation and say, well, from tomorrow I know the die, so I'm going to what? Why not business today? I'm going to close off all my accounts, give out what I give out. I'm going to die in the next few hours. Nobody knows this. Nobody can ever what? Predetermine that Allah says, Nahnu qaddarna bainakumul maut. I am the one who creates that amongst you. And certainly, you are nothing more than being helpless with this. You cannot do anything about it. You cannot supersede the condition of returning to life when I pronounce death for you. That is it. How great you are, how powerful you might be, when I decree death, no one could stop it. Am nahnu qalikum? Am I not the creator? Am I not Allah the creator? You want to determine that? I tell you, when I say you die, you die. And this is how Allah SWT describes his kudrat and his power to us. After describing the destination of people, he says, when I determine that, none can change that. And upon that, I can replace you. I can replace you. And put somebody else in your place, whom you yourself don't even know about. I can replace an entire nation. Any time of Banu Israel, the people on the Sabbath day, what they used to do? They made these things to what? Hold the fish on the Sabbath day. Allah sometimes called them to turn to apes and into swines and finish them off. After three days, every one of them what? Died. The people came and recognized them in the state of being animals. And they knew that this was their relatives, but Allah caused them to die in the state. To show to us and a sign towards them that do not defy the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace you at any time. And we are not too what? Too great to be replaced. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can replace us with anyone he so desires. Who we ourselves do not even know about. And he says, لَقَدْ عَلِمْتُ نَشْعَةَ الْأُولَى فَلَوْلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْتُ نَشْعَةَ الْأُولَى فَلَوْلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ and you were aware of the first creation. You know how Allah made this existence from the very first man. And then how you all came into existence and reprocreated and continued to live as human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you are aware of this. You are aware of this. I have taught you, O oh mankind, your way and how you came into existence. Yet there are people who say that people came from what? Apes. And from other what? Whatever form they transform from whatever animal to become a human being. But till today, no more apes ever what? Made human beings. But it has what? Totally closed off. So if this is their theory, it doesn't what? Make any sense. And the next aspect of it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I have taught mankind 
that I have made you from the very beginning. And after bringing you into existence, I, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has also taught you how you should become and how you should meet and how you should have children. And that system existed from the time of Adam alayhi salam and continue to exist. And those people who are those people who deny the creation of man in the system that Allah has taught us and think that mankind has started from some animal, they themselves get married to women or men of their same type of people and have children. So they, they themselves follow the adat and the custom and the system that Allah has set in place. Nothing new. Even and despite their what? Thinking and their thoughts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he continues and tells us here. He says, after mentioning it, he says, three other important aspects. He says, أَفَرَعَيْتُمْ مَا تَحْرُثُونَ Who are the ones? Do you think that you cause things to grow? أَفَرَعَيْتُمْ مَا تَحْرُثُونَ you put plants into the ground. You put the seeds there. Do you feel it really grows by your will? There are three important aspects in a human's civilization and in human life that is very important for their existence. One, plants, vegetation, food, fire, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about. And he also speaks about inhab inhabitants that surrounds us. And let's talk about the first one. He says, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, says, أَفَرَعَيْتُ مَا تَحْرُثُونَ Who causes the food to grow? Who causes the tree to grow? أَأَنْتُمْ تَزْرَعُونَهُ أَمْ نَحْنُ الزَّارِعُونَ You grow it or I grow it? You grow the trees or I grow the trees? Remember in the story last week we talked about of Banu Israel? When they want Allah's promise, he says, If you continue with your wickedness, I will cause when the time comes to grow plants, for no rain to fall. And if you happen to grow any plants and it were to produce food, I will cause rain to fall in the time of harvest and all of it will be destroyed. Remember that incident we talk about Banu Israel? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, He says, أَأَنْتُمْ تَزْرَعُونَ هُوَمْ نَحْنُ zari'un." Who causes it to grow? You cause these plants to grow? Or is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes it to grow? There is none other than Allah. And Allah SWT says, لَوْ نَشَا جَعَلْنَاهُ حُطَامًا فَظَلْتُمْ تَفَكَّهُونَ He says, for you to have the fruits that these trees produce, it is not just by mere you trying to do all these things that we do today, to produce bigger fruits and better vegetation and more what? You know, produce more in lesser capacity or space and get maximum production on food. We think about all these technologies and things today in our food system and producing food. But all this technology and all this thought and all this system of growing food, Allah is saying, أَفَرَأَيْتُمْ مَا تَحْرُثُونَ Who causes it to grow? And this is the part of life that we must always never forget. That we put something in the ground and expect it to grow and produce food. But it only happens, inshallah, if Allah so wills that it grows. Not by our own what? Effort. Because sometimes it can actually even grow, bear the fruit, but you can never harvest it. You can never harvest it. Allah can take it away even from your hands at that point in time. So we're thinking to ourselves that we are producing, but we'll never be able to reap. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, in, in mentioning this ayat, and we'll stop at this verse here because we're out of time, that, you know, he's telling us clearly that, all of this that happens to us human beings, who is in the driver's seat? It is Allah. Allah is the one who created us. Allah is the one who grew the food for us. Allah is the one who caused the produce to grow. Despite if we had to feed millions of people, it is Allah that causes it to bear so that we can eat from it. And he says, Who causes the water that falls and you accumulate it and you drink who gives you that water to drink? Yes, we could produce it, we could money, you know, refine it and have pipe water, we could have bottled water, we could have our water in a big lake, in a pond, wherever you want to have the water stored, in tanks, whatever storage containers, and we charge people for the water. But still, who produces and gives this water? Allah says, 
Who gives you this water to drink? In Surah Al-Mulk, in the ayat it says, If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withholds the water from this earth, man ilahukum ya'atikum bi. Which God can ever bring back water to the earth? If Allah takes away water. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us water to drink, He says, Antum anzaltumuhu min al-muzni or amnahnu al-munzilun. Who sends it down from the sky? Is it me or is it you? I am the one who controls the system that we get rain by. The whole system, whether it is from evaporation and we see the clouds and the rain and the whole system. Allah is the one in charge of this and He can send the rain to do benefit. He can send it to do destruction. He can cause flooding by it. He can cause so many harm and good by it. But Allah says, I am in charge of this system. It is not by your will. It is by the way of the will of Allah. That's why even when there is drought and famine, we are told to what to make? Dua and ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what? Rain. Salatul istisqa. Alright? So we stop there today inshallah. Pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless each and every one of you inshallah for making the time to be here throughout the weeks that went by. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless each and every one of you and your family members. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you all in good health. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you all prosperity and goodness inshallah. And inshallah when the, we start by inshallah that we try our best to encourage others to be part of this system of da'wah and education because it's very important for us to benefit not only ourselves but everyone in the community to be aware about their religion and their duty towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever little that we learn, it is for the benefit for ourselves for the life of the hereafter. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to bless us for being in an environment where the knowledge has been learned about his way of life that he wants for us. And definitely we'll be what? Rewarded richly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So jazakallahu khair. Let us all make dua inshallah and complete. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarakta adhal jalali wal ikram. Allahumma rabbana yassir wa la tu'assir wa tamam bil khair. Wa bika nasta'een ya fattah. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al janna jannatu al firdaus. Wa na'udhu bika min al nar. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhira. Hasanatan wa qina azab al nar. فسبحان ربك رب العزة أما يسفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين Born on a glorious day